So today, when I was asked to speak, I was ruminating on a few different topics, but then the Lord um, pressed upon me to share a dream that I had with you guys, and then to focus on portions of that dream. But today, he, he wants to remind us that he is our rock, what that means, that he is a shelter. In him are the living waters that quench our thirsty souls. He is our beloved, and we can hide in him. So let's pray. Father, I ask that your spirit of wisdom and understanding would come, that you would alight upon us, that the words that come from you would find root in ready soil to spring up in the hearts of those here. Let your peace reign in this place. Amen. Okay, so in this dream, y'all are going to have to journey with me, okay? And look, look what I did for y'all. These are going to be all my scripture references. And I'm like, if I have to say every single one of these, they're going to be like, say that again, say that again. So now you can take a screenshot and study on your own, okay? But in this dream that I had, I was riding with others, and I noticed that the skies turned dark. I knew a storm was coming, and there were lots of trees all around. And I begin to feel a sense of terror as I noticed that three tornadoes came down and the skies turned black. And they were massive. And I knew they were coming towards us. And while I was riding in the car, I thought, oh, we need to go. We need to go to that, that place up there because there's a city and we're going to find actual shelter like man-made, I don't know, storm places. But as we were driving, I noticed a path, a small little path through the dense forest. And in my heart, I heard, go that way. And even though I didn't want to, because it didn't make sense, I did it anyway. And I said, we have to go that way. As I drove through, the road ended at a rock. And all of this, as the wind is whipping about, you can hear the And I got out of the car, and I went into underneath the rock. And I laid down prostrate under the rock. And the tornadoes came. But I wasn't harmed. We weren't harmed. And as I saw the skies had lit up again, I left the shelter of the rock and noticed that I was actually at the foot of a mountain. And all around were places for crops to be grown. And then suddenly I was on the top of the mountain and there were these massive, massive lemon trees that were my responsibility to tend and to care for. These lemons were the size of basketballs. And actually, after looking it up, they're called Amalfi lemons. And they have a bulbous rind, very sweet smelling. And they can only be grown in harsh conditions on a mountain in real life. And the rind is actually edible. It's actually sweet. And so... I was there. My responsibility was to grow these fruits that could only be grown there, and there was a school at the top of the mountain, and that was a dream. So today, 
the Lord wanted me to focus on the first portions of the dream up to the place of the ascent of the mountain. And the next time I speak, he wants me to talk about the rest. But the first kind of segment that I want to point out in the dream was the tornadoes, right? We're going to talk about the sovereignty of God here. You all know that life is not easy. The, The journey of this human life is filled with struggle and loss and and joys, but lots of pain, right? It seems that sorrow and suffering is a, a ready friends several times a year, right? But have you ever guys have you guys ever heard that tornadoes are called the finger of God? So F five tornadoes are called the finger of God because they're they're so massive that they literally look like a finger is coming down from the sky. And the Lord wanted me to hover over his sovereignty. That nothing in this life comes to us, but that is first approved by the hands of God. That can be a really, really hard thing to wrestle with. But the purpose of the Lord in this life is not to bring us happiness, comfort, right? He loves us and he wants to give us life and life abundant. But his greatest purpose is to transform us to look like his son. And he will use every broken thing. He will use every loss. He will will use the good and the bad to that end. Lamentations 3, 38 through 40 says, Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? Why should any living mortal, any man, offer complaint in view of his sins? Let's examine and probe our ways, and let's return to the Lord. Good and ill. Job 12, 9 through 10 says, Which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. You see, I honestly think sometimes we give Satan too much glory by rebuking things left and right, and it's the enemy, it's the enemy, it's the enemy. But the sovereignty of God demands thankfulness even in that. The sovereignty of God, lamentations, both ill and good come forth from his hands. The higher way to see is that nothing comes to us, but that first comes through the hands of our God. Satan and the trouble he can cause are below the authority and the sovereignty of God. I'm sure you guys have heard of Corey Ten Boom. Mom's told this story a lot of times, but I absolutely love her story. Um, I've read her book so many times. But best story is that um, her and her sister were in uh, one of the Holocaust camps and the barrack that they ended up having to stay in, uh, fiercely overcrowded, was also um, infested and riddled with fleas. It was so bad that the guards would not even step foot inside the barracks. Um, And Corey's sister was complaining, just complaining. And Corey said, even in this we must thank God. Lord, I thank you for the fleas. And her sister didn't understand. 
she's like, mm -mm, no, this is horrible. Not only are we starving, we can't sleep, we're overcrowded, we've lost our families, we've lost our lives, we've lost our things, but fleas. And it was later that they found out that that was the reason the guards could not come in, which was gave them the ability to lead Bible studies to lead many to the Lord and actually have a place of community within that barracks. So the tornadoes, the sovereignty of God, the higher way of seeing is, Lord, I thank you. I don't understand, but I thank you. I know your ways are higher than this, my, higher than my understanding. I am in God's hands This is the lesson that Jesus learned. Scripture says that Jesus learned obedience through that which he suffered. And how, how much more so we learning obedience, learning to bend, learning to submit through suffering. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 said, Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. And when Jesus said, Take up your cross and follow me, he was saying, Walk the way I walked. Walk the way I walked. Not my will, but yours. And this requires following the voice of God, right? Which is the next segment of the dream. I, I, I felt like I needed to go to that city because there's a man-made shelter. Like, you know, cities have stuff like that, concrete, hard things, safety. But there was a little voice that way. Really? A tiny dirt path through the forest. Really? But yes. Take up your cross and follow me. Following the voice of the Lord and not what man-made wisdom says, right? And it's in that following that we are led, led to the actual real place of shelter, of safety, of peace, of rest for our weary, weary souls. Proverbs 5 through, uh, 3, 5 through 6 shares, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So the rock that we are led to as we follow his voice. I was reminded of the cleft of the rock. I'm sure you guys know that story with Moses, right? It's in Exodus 33. And it's actually what I'm going to focus on the next time I speak is this being led up to the mountain through that kind of a cleft. But what happened was Moses actually said, Lord, show me your glory. The Lord had already promised to go with him. He said, my presence shall grow with, go with you, and I will bring you rest. I will bring you the new walk rest that I spoke about last time, right? He had promised that just a few verses before. But Moses had a fear problem, which many of us do, I do. And he's constantly self-doubting. He's constantly doubting God. But in this, he said, Lord, just show me your glory. And the Lord took Moses, and he, it said that he stood him upon a rock beside him. And then he said, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And as I pass by, I will cover you with my hand. And you shall see my back, but not my face. Okay? So we're going to put a pin in that. 
because that's next week. It's like, what does that mean? However, there's another place that talks about the cleft of the rock. And that is what the Lord wanted me to give to you guys today. And it's from Song of Songs 2, 13b through 14. I actually prefer the NASB, NASB version in this because there's a segment, uh, a, pass, a portion that's lost in some of the translations. So if, you, if you're going to go read that one, read it in NASB, okay? But it says, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep pathway. Let me see your form. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your form is lovely. Clefts are a place of concealment, safety, refuge. And in the secret place of the Most High, that word is a place of shelter, of cover. And of course, the pathway, here we see it again, Steep place, stairs going up, which I think is amazing because that's what it was in the dream too. The rock was right next to the foothill of the mountain of the Lord. The cleft, which the dove, the bride of the beloved, right? Song of Songs is this beautiful conversation, this pursuit and of, of the, the beloved for his, his beauty, his bride. That place that we have with him is next to him, next to his heart. Jesus, we know, is the rock, right? And uh, not only do we stand upon him, right, What's the hymn? All of the ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. But he's also the cleft in the rock, which we can hide in. Okay, got to follow me on this, I know. It's kind of weird, but it's exciting. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. Ready for this? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Who knows that one, right? Every married person in here, and probably most of y'all that aren't. This is a profound mystery, Paul says, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. That same verse that talks about man and woman becoming one in marriage is actually the mystery of the bride and her beloved, of Christ and his church. There's a unity, a union that we come into in him. And the reason this is important is because if we understand not only the sovereignty of God and following him, but if we understand our identity in him, that is a shelter from any storm. If we understand our identity upon him, standing on his rock, a sure, steady place, then there won't be any sinking. So, speaking of this mystery... 
You guys know that Christ is called the, the final Adam, right? The new Adam. Um, even when Adam was formed in the garden, that it was kind of a, a pre-shadow, a foreshadow of what Christ would do. So it's a, a symbolic um, echo there. But what I thought was just so beautiful was that in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul says that as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And it's verse 45 where he calls Jesus the, the last, final, ultimate Adam. But the beauty of this is that the formation of the bride for Adam in the beginning is the same formation of the bride in Christ's death. Okay, go with me. What happened when God created Eve? He said it's not good for man to be alone. And so he took Adam and he put him in a deep sleep. And he opened up his side. He took a rib from Adam. And from that rib, he created Eve as a bride, as a companion, as an etzer connecto for Adam. Where do we see this echoed? How about when Jesus was on the cross and with a spear they opened his side and water and blood gushed out? This was after his death. To confirm that he was dead, they did not break his legs, they speared him. And then he was in a what? Deep slumber for three days? He was in death for three days? And then when he arose, he had made a place for his bride, a place right next to his side. They actually say that that water and blood pack is something that's caused an extreme agony and death, and it's almost like formed around the heart. So when I think about that spear going in and piercing right up next to Jesus' heart, this place right here for his bride, right next to his side, that is the cleft. It, he is our cleft. He has made space for us next to his heart. He has formed the bride, the church. So that one day, when we all join the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? One day it will be in fullness. You guys following? Through this same wound, that blood and water is imagery for salvation, water baptism, providing a way for us. Not only our redemption, but also our sustenance, our life force, the waters that we can drink from and never be thirsty again. Christ is also echoed in the passage where y'all will, most of y'all will know this, where Moses is told to, to strike the rock and water comes out of the rock, right? You remember that, right? And then later he disobeys because he's supposed to speak to the rock, but he strikes it anyway and he wasn't supposed to strike it and then he gets in trouble. Okay, but when Moses struck the rock, water poured out so that the people could drink. And Paul actually speaks about this in 1 Corinthians. He connects it to Christ. He says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud. They passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Again, Christ, the rock that we can hide in, next to his heart, beside him, drinking from him, being covered by his blood. 
that death would pass over and we could live with him forever. Psalm 91, 1 through 4 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. It is his truth which will be your shield. So, I wanted to share an old hymn with you guys. It's actually pretty popular, so some of you might know it. But man, when, when God was just sitting, on, sitting this on me, for these last couple of weeks, I, it was all connected when I was listening to the song like nonstop this week. And so I really felt like there was something the Lord wanted to impart to you guys as we listen to it, okay? There is a portion of this song um, that is not in the original. They added a chorus for modernity. Uh, but it was written by... Top Lady in 1776, it's called Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. you guys to let him move you into that place let him move you into that cleft as you even listen rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in me let the
He is the rock of ages, the cleft for me, which we hide. The water and the blood from his wounded side. Making us pure. (laughs) Coming to him for dress. Nothing in our hands to bring. It can't be the labors of our hands. We can't fulfill the law's demands. Even our tears, forever flowing, would not be enough for the sin, but his blood is. He saves in him alone. So, know who you are in him. Know who you are as his bride, his precious, precious dove. Your voice is sweet. Your form is lovely. Find your solace in the beloved. And know that he promised trouble. (laughs) In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world, is what he said. And everything, all that happens, ultimately, for he is sovereign. So follow his voice. Let him bring you close and draw you into his heart. I'll mention this next week, but just because it's coming to me, I'll spontaneously say it. But when the veil was torn in two, when Jesus was resurrected, that veil was the body, the rent body of Christ, who made a way, gave us access. And next week when I talk about Moses not being able to talk to the Lord face to face. He didn't have Jesus. Because Jesus provides us access like that. When my, you know, and these are, these are light troubles. But when my kids just irk me to no end. And I'm like, oh, Lord, how did I, where did I go wrong? I mean, some of them turned out good, and then we got to. (sighs) 
instantly, I'm right that he's, he's said, come on. You're with me. Let me give you wisdom for this. Let me show you the path. Or I'm exhausted because I have cat in the hat <laughs> on the ball. <sighs> I don't know why I say yes to this. But then he's like, look, let me give you rest. You need to rest. You need to lay down on the rock. I love the positioning that's shown in these scriptures too because sometimes it's standing, sometimes it's kneeling, sometimes it's laying. And in all of that, he can lead us and guide us, right? Okay, so to close, I actually want to speak some scriptures over you because when the word of the Lord goes forth, it does not come back void. And so, just a bunch of, they're already up there, so don't worry about writing them down. Psalm 73, 26, and let this rise up as a prayer and declaration in your heart, because that's what I do when I'm reading these. I'm just like, yes, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the rock of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 32, 7, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Psalm 119, 114, you are my hiding place and my shield, so I will wait for your word. Psalm 27, 5, For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. Psalm 31, 20. You hide them in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of man. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. Isaiah 26, 4. So trust in the Lord forever, for he, the Lord God, is our rock. We have an everlasting rock. And this prayer, Psalm 71.3. Be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You have given commandment to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. And Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you new rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. All right. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you... Woo us, pursue us, remind us. Remind us who we are. Provide shelter. Nothing in our hands to give. It comes from you. I thank you for the blood. I thank you for your waters. I ask for each of these here today. Woo them in. Lead them to that secret place in you again. They could find rest for their souls. Amen. Yeah. so funny that she talked on this because in worship I was sensing a lot of like anxiety and worries and cares 
And I couldn't tell if it was me or, you know, just me sensing what's going on in the room. And literally, I'm like, run, quick, run, Nicole, run. And um, my safe place is I see myself in a meadow beside um, a little pond. And um, it's my quiet place where I find him. And um, centering myself on Psalm 23 and reminding me who he is. And it's, um, I even insert my name sometimes, so if that helps you. Um, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for he's close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just something to center us and remind us he's right there. That's what it did for me. So it was funny that that was going on. That was what was in worship. So cool. So awesome. We, we are ending a little early. I was, you know, told 35, 40 minutes and I'm punctual. So <laughs> anybody who knows me, <laughs> punctual. Um, so I guess I'll just open it up for questions or whatever before it just to give that kind of community space. Anything? Words, confirmations? Okay. Um, Recently, I had been crying out for some struggles I'm having at work. Anyway, um, I'm doing a lot of scriptures, feeding my soul, and one of them was... um, we all know it. Cast your cares on the Lord, for he cares for you. And I mean, that was in my head so much. Okay, it was what I had to do, cast. But this time he really, really put in me, Arlene, I care for you. I care for you. I'm here. I'm here. And to me, that's all the same thing. Yeah. Because it's not another do. Because right. we need more. We need, exactly, because we're already the cat in the hat, and it's like, what else can I add? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Would love that. Yeah. It's been about 15 years ago, but I had a vision, and it was almost like I was experiencing it. I wasn't watching it. It was happening, and I was standing on a mountain. It was lush and green. And the Lord was calling me to cross over. There was a swinging bridge. You know those rope bridges that it cover an expanse? And he was calling me out to walk across this expanse. And it, it was scary. But he was holding my hands. And I was walking forward. And he was holding my hands walking backwards. And he brought me across to this other mountain that was red rock it was no vegetation no greenery it wasn't pretty and lush like the other one but he brought me into a a cave which was the cleft of the rock and he's he just but he brought me there and sometimes in that place that cleft may not be as beautiful and lush as we would like <laughs> It's kind of a, almost looked like a barren place, but it was a place where he was going to teach me some trust, some deal with some issues. And I just want to, um, Psalm 61, if I can get it to come up right. <sighs> Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I call to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter and a refuge for me, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever, and let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. So, 
everything you were saying was like I kept remembering visions and dreams, and the Lord is speaking all of that to all of us. It's, it's his heart, you know. And I want to add something beautiful about that because you said the second mountain was Red Rock. Yeah, it wasn't pretty. But that's the thing, like, okay, this might be Lord. Okay, yes. Um, red is, is that new life, right? Let's, sorry, women's cycles, okay? Or, or, or having a baby, right? That there, there's a place of nothing that we come to but then grows into the something grows into the fruitfulness brings us and it's that place of intimacy intimacy with him that fruitfulness actually and so it's the exact same image because that that rock was at the foot of this mountain where the produce and the vegetation, of course, at the top of the mountain were the lemon trees. But beautiful, yes. This is really Kevin's story, but he's not in here. He's in kids' church, so I'm going to share him. This is this week. He felt called to go and read Hind's Feet. And so you called it out in the service. And he specifically talked to me, he's like, because we've been having a lot of conversations about this kind of stuff. And he called out specifically in the part of the book when it looks like, why, can't, why am I going this way? I'm, and it veers you off the path, and it doesn't make sense to us, but there's a reason. So I just want to call out that connection because um, that was Kevin's connection this week. About Heinz feet. I need to read that again. Yes, that's so beautiful. Okay, anybody else? Oh, yes, sir. I was thinking about uh, when I saw Psalm 91 up there before we even got to it, and I always remember that there's a a song by Andrew Smith. He's a Vineyard Canada guy from back when David Roos was was with him, and, and there's a song he did of Psalm 91 that's just always been a, a go-to for me. And um, in fact, I now have it tied to a memory when your dad was in the hospital. And there was one night, it was like a two in the morning, three in the morning text alert from Chris to a handful of us going, hey, it's really bad right now. And I got up and I was praying. I went into the garage and called her. I I texted and said, is it okay to call you? And I called her and I said, I just feel like I'm supposed to sing this song over you. And I just, she said, okay, you know. So I'm in the garage, so I don't wake anybody up. I'm like, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow. And it's that phrasing of that song, that that small segment right there. He who dwells in the shelter will rest in the shadow. The rest comes as we dwell. There's a prerequisite to the the rest. It's not like, oh, he just dumps the rest on you wherever. It's as we dwell, as we come into that cleft of his presence that the rest washes over us. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask because I have not been able to find it. I know like in most movies when they spear Jesus, it's on the right side. But that doesn't make sense to me because the heart's on the left side and we're near the heart. So is there any place that you know of in the Bible that I've missed that really says that? Actually, no. It's not in the Bible whether it was on the right or the left. And when they started using iconography, 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 that word. <laughs> Thank you, church history class. Um, yeah, they, that was just the way they depict it, depicted it. But either way, whether that was from the right or the left, because even from the left, it could have gone through the cavity underneath the heart. Um, but yeah, it's actually not uh, ever spoken about in Scripture on which side. Yeah. Nope, nope, not at all. That's just church 
history, and it just repeats itself. Pictures. Okay, any, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to confirm again the um, Psalm 91 um, in a in a way of preparing me mm-hmm. for yeah. what was to come. Mm-hmm. The Lord uh, had a minister deliver to uh, my husband, and he came home with it with Psalm 91 and. Uh, a couple of weeks before that, uh, my very precious godmother, um, from when I was young, the person I first came to the Lord with, um, had told me that she reads that psalm every morning. And uh, so I had started reading it, and then my husband came home with Psalm 91. And it's been, it's been on my mind and in my heart. And I, I've recently lost my brother. And that psalm has shown me so much. And the confirmation of it coming from, yes. from now the church here is, is tremendous mm-hmm. to me. Thanks. Awesome. Well, the Lord bless you guys. As you know, uh, Mom and Dad, Pastor Dino, Pastor Chris, they're in Santa Barbara this week. So um, I'm just going to open it up for ministry now. Bless you guys as you go, even though we're 20 minutes early. Spend some time hanging out a little bit then. Got some time. Um, but if you need any prayer, any ministry needs, I would invite you to come up. We have people willing and ready to pray with you and walk through life with you.